Greetings, world, and greetings, Seven Spot. Boy, have we got a treat for you today. It is another virtual and extremely socially distant Sevens. And you've been waiting for it. I've been waiting for it. But we've got something really special today because it's a twofer. Not only is a virtual and socially distant seven, but it's also deep in the shed. I've told you before that what we're doing is going to be working with a lot of folks who are deep in the shed. And I've got a few programming notes that you'll see on Facebook seven spot um, on that very point. And it's just so we can introduce you to a few projects that we are going to be bringing along. But enough about me. It's not about me. Let's bring in Bruce Wilkins in Perth, I think. Let's bring That's him it. in here. There we go. Hello, Good morning, Bruce. Jim. Good morning. How are you? Very well, thank you. All right, that's great. I'm going to bring myself in as well. And here we go. There we go. I, I'm going to say good morning to you, and it's good afternoon to me. But you know what? It's your turn because I was on your Zoom call at 5 o'clock in the morning, and you got to watch me in my pajamas. <laughs> well, the good news is only, it's only uh, nine minutes past. or It's only just gone 7 a.m. here, so we're right on time. <laughs> Yeah, you. It's about me 11 degrees outside, which is all right. It's going to climb to, to uh, 16 or something today. It is a bit of a couple of little storm fronts coming through. In fact, if you had it got on 30 seconds earlier, there was a dirty great big wind outside blowing, trying to blow my shed away or my father in law's shed away. But we're, we're good, ready to go. Good, good. Well, as I've always said to everyone, this isn't about me, um, it's about um, the stories that um, our cars can tell. And what I wanted to do um, is introduce you to, um, I guess, to Seven Spot in the world. But you've got two projects on the go because um, you are involved with, as I read my programming, you are the secretary of the Sports Car Builders Club of Western Australia. And I'm wondering if, if um, you could take us for a little tour around your shed and show us the two projects you're, you're, you're on the go with. And then could you please just take a moment to sit down and tell us what the, um, the Sport Car Builders Club is about? Because I thought when, when I first called you that it's about a bunch of blokes helping each other build their cars. But you know what? You do a heck of a lot more than that, don't you? Yeah, that's correct. Yes. Okay. Um, well, I'm going to... I will. I'll come back to the Builders Club in a minute for sure for you. All right. Well, I'm going to take myself right out of the picture and I'm going to let you get right into it. And you can, it's your thing, Bruce. Do what you want okay, to do. No worries. <laughs> All good. So we're going to um, go around to the, whoops, I didn't want to do that. Push the wrong silly button. We're going to go to the front camera. So like all good clubbies, uh, the best thing to do is to sit in your car and protect, pretend even though it's nowhere near drivable. So this is my uh, low cost. When I say mine, it's actually a, a man called Brian. Unfortunately, Brian passed away a year and a bit ago and uh, I purchased this from his wife and i'm sure most of us have all spent a lot of time sitting in um you know shifting gears pretending that we can actually get these things to go so this is a good old low cost build straight out of that book that you showed us a couple of minutes ago there jim it's um, yes i picked this up it came with um, most of the stuff wasn't put together but he's obviously put it in quite a number of times so it's got coilovers all the other good things this is a toyota uh, twin cam two liter four ague yeah. Um, so I'm Still looking for a number plate called uh, Brian for ages if I can get it because that'll be a yeah. nice pun on the on the respect for Brian and also for the bits and pieces. So I picked this up. Um, funny enough, they advertised it when Brian was around for uh, nine thousand, and I was so close. If I hadn't been into my other car for eleven thousand, I would have uh, bought this as an absolute um, no-brainer. Came with uh, Toyota T50 gearboxes, two of those, um, mm -hmm. and it's got good old banjo rear end differential in it and there's in fact uh, i think three of those sitting outside in the shed as well uh -huh. um that's a rubbish old steel wheel but i've got these old things called roh which are um, made by a company called onga not a particularly good part of that but um i like those because they were the wheels that were around when i was a kid and uh, i thought hey why not you got to do some good things so um about all i've done in this build at the moment is i've done the steering rack which 
basically is built like the Sydney Harbour Bridge and probably a bit over-engineered, but I know that it will add some structural strength to the front. And the problem we have, obviously, in uh, Western Australia is the torsional rigidity. It's basically a 4,000 newton metre for one degree uh, twist of the frame. So they shove a couple of hundred kilos on the front, a metre out from the front of your um, front bracket here, and they measure the torsional body twist at the end. Yes. And if it doesn't meet those requirements, then they don't pass your vehicle. So this has got um, most of the stuff. Brian's been working on this since 2006 because um, I went through and I think he was on to his uh, fifth or sixth license. You get a license or a permit um, mm -hmm. from the DOT, which we'll talk about later on. And that lasts for two years. I think he was on his fifth one of those, unfortunately, because his mm -hmm. health kept getting in the way of it. So, um, yeah, so this was the, what did I put on my MEV so uh, side, I put what do you do when you're trying to get a car built? You buy another one just to really get in the, in the way. Um, yeah. The only things that I've actually done, apart from that front steering rack, I also over engineered the mounting bracket that the um, they're only just sitting there, there's no doubt about that. I over engineered this bracket here, and uh -huh. uh, my roll bar is um, that is duct tape there. This is a piece of what we call poly pipe, and I think it's a bit of industrial. Um, in what an irrigation pipe sitting there across at the moment, so yes, I haven't okay. actually. I've only put that in place just to start mocking out. Uh, Brian yeah. had already done all the fuel tank and all those sort of things, and um, I placed these coilovers. So there's a fair bit on that one still to do. Um, yeah. To get this license, it still needs quite a few more um, plates and so forth in on the framework here. Mm -hmm. um, he was very good enough to have gone and bought a brand new set of Wilwood. Um, pedal brackets so for, for $2,000 everybody can see out there that that was an absolute bargain so um, I'm Very in the nice. process those other bits of pipe down here I'm in the process of trying to line up my steering so I can get some um, brackets made up for that and um, get the steering rack going. I was originally when I bought this trying to do that one and the other one which I'm about to show you right now as a pair but um, I realised that and the, the bad thing about it is that the low-cost clubby here looks closer to being a roller. If I put the, got a wheel for the shiny metal hub over the back there, yeah. um, which I have got a wheel, I just haven't <laughs> put it on. If yeah. I put that on there, I could push it out of the driveway, basically, and push it around the yard. Um, yes. I could connect the tail shaft and probably even get it to drive. You know, it's one of those silly things. But there's mm -hmm. hundreds of hours of bodywork to go on it, which I yeah. don't really have the time for just now. So I've decided I wouldn't do both of these as a pair. I would go back and do my pride and joy which is the hopefully the view in the window in the background not too bright um now it does have a plate on the front but trust me that is one that i found on the road i yeah. just wanted to make sure that i set up the brackets so when i bought this car the guy who was importing them was building the frames actually in western australia because the frames from england uh, were nowhere near compliant they're made out of inch by inch 25 mm -hmm. by 25 mil steel and um this frame here is basically being made out of 50 by um, 25. So I'll show you a bit more, a few photos in a minute. I'll just walk around just for now. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, he basically decided he would build the frames here and just import the bodies from uh, MEV in Well, that, um, that's England. what I was going to ha ask. I mean, that's seldom, I believe, engineering. And I was going to ask, do they import the, uh, the space frame or is it just the plastic that he's bring, brought along? Uh, he's just bringing in the, uh, you know, the fiberglass plastic uh, frames and the body, oh, sorry, the body. And uh, the roll bar is a MEV product. Um, mm -hmm. What else does he bring in? Oh, I think he actually gets the coilovers and those sort of things. So he brings in the stuff that comes in the kit, everything other than the, the frame. Mm -hmm. So, um, yeah, and the back number plate is actually one off the sh um, a bit of junk out in the yard out here that my father-in-law, that's his old trailer number plate. Um, so I just put them on there just to make sure I didn't do silly things like put uh, lights and that sort of stuff in a place that eventually I have to go and put a number plate in. So I've tried to do those sort of things. Trust me, I um, know. I've, I've, I've actually, I'm guilty enough of um, cutting a hole into some of the fiberglass on mine when I was building it and needed to fill it in and bond to it and sand it and paint it. Yep. So I do know you have to be careful. For sure. Um, so now we can just go in and show you a few other things. Now these, um, for those people who don't know, the um, MEV plan, just trying to hook that up there because I don't have a bonnet catch at the moment. Okay, so let me show you what I just did. Just open that up. 
Uh, these are based around, you basically go and buy the complete kit from um, the UK distributor. And if you're over in England, you go and buy a Mark One Ford Focus. Mm -hmm. I think it's up to about 2004 or five or something like that. You take the Focus home and you pull all the bits out and you put them into this and they reckon you can do it in 130 hours or something like that. I spent probably 300 hours making brackets, so I don't I, know how they can possibly. <laughs> yeah, I, I don't know. I mean, that sounds a little bit light, doesn't it? <laughs> yeah, I do have one of these that I've, um, a friend of mine has driven in Western Australia. He's got one exactly the same as this. Uh, he put a, or his son bought him a turbocharger, so he turbocharged it. Um, he spent a year, he was fully retired, um, and he'd also built a clubby before. So he had lots of experience, and uh, he's mm -hmm. put that together. So, um, you know, that's where that is. I'm in the middle of just um, now getting things to bolt together. I've got wiring lying around. I've actually hidden a fair bit of it today so you don't see it. Um, mm -hmm. You know, once again, I spent some time, tail lights here, but I made up the aluminium bracket. I stopped welding because my welding is very touch and go. If you TIG weld, anybody who knows who've done any TIG welding knows mm -hmm. that uh, unless you spend a lot of time doing it all the time, um, mm -hmm. it's, it's just, it's fraught with danger. The yeah. exhaust manifold here, I've actually flipped it around because previously this engine, um, this would have been the firewall right here on the focus. Yes. And this went underneath the firewall. So now that I've changed it around, I had to change the direction of the catalytic converter. So I've mm -hmm. bent that and I've just started down here, the little crack here. I've just been fixing up the welding. So I've completely changed the design of that. And my original brief for my thing, when I spent uh, the car that was sitting out here, the red one I showed you before, um, so I've got a photo over here. When I, for everybody else who's watching, I'll give you a quick get out where the light's better. So directly outside of this was originally that car sitting right out here where the other two cars are here at the moment. Yeah. Um, that, that was delivery day. And um, there's your MEB so and there's your focus. Enough, <laughs> that's right. And interesting enough, the wheelbase and everything else is obviously the width wise is exactly the same. It's not that far away from the actual length of the, the focus as well so you'd expect it to handle pretty darn close to the original car just take out 400 kilos worth of uh what i'd call irrelevant sideways stuff called safety material <laughs> and um, all of a sudden you've got a car that's reasonably good so um yeah yeah the whole transaxle everything else just fits straight into here it's really good and then all you have to do is to do all the suspension bits might as well show this side um mm -hmm. so at the moment my issue is oops putting that down on the ground is to measure the length of that, stick it in there, take out the old bearing out of that, put that yeah. bearing onto that plate there. In fact, not take that bearing out. Yes. Take the bearing out, but rebuild a bearing carrier for in here yep. um, and then get everything to line up and do all those sort of things. So, And this bit of metal here is nowhere near strong enough if you look at it on the, any yeah, of the it looks, decent it doesn't ME look quite, sites. doesn't look too chunky. Yeah, no, they've got a whole lot of extra bracing they put on there. Interesting enough, there are a few people around, guaranteed, that are running that as a straight piece of metal, which is barely five mil um, on their cars. I guarantee you could probably find dozens of them that have just gone, not even put any structural strength, strength mm. into that whatsoever. Hopefully, there's not too many ra racing with that sort of a setup, but certainly there'd be quite a few. Um, and I've done silly things like I've got an additional firewall, so that aluminium plate over the back here runs all the way down the bottom. Um, mm -hmm. That's actually double sided. I'll just close that because it looks better with a boot shut. Um, engine mount. That engine mount there is actually an old suspension component that I completely re engineered. Um, the one on the other side is actually the original engine mount. That's not so bad. Mm -hmm. Get that out of the way at the moment. And a good friend of mine in the club said, um, Don't worry about the body fitment. It's a fiberglass thing. If anybody can get any fiberglass to ever fit, then they're doing better than, than he is. Mm -hmm. And he's a body specialist. Um, getting seats was an absolute nightmare because they, one, have to be compliant. And funny enough, I took in and there's a 30 centimetre disc or something you put down here on the seat. And it's got to measure to a certain height for head clearance and all these other silly things. When I yes, was in the course. shop doing that, and it was a shop that's been around for a long time. The, the lady there said, what are you doing? I said, well, the rules say you have to have all these measurements made on your seats before you can put them in. Um, she said, well, nobody's ever done that. And I said, that's because most people just shove the seats in. No, they did leave the original compliance seats in, um, go and get a license and then come home and pull the seats out. And I said, I didn't want to do it. I want to have a car that's licensed with everything legal and everything mm -hmm. else. So um, I've gone to a fair bit of trouble to make sure. I even re-engineered the 
um, focus mirrors. I could have gone and got any one of a dozen bike mirrors that were lighter, smaller, everything else. Um, piece mm -hmm. of steel I made up here. Got about 15 different angles in it. Anybody's ever yep. tried to get many different angles to get it, but the reality is I vowed that I would use as much of my son's focus because I did pay him <laughs> three and a half thousand for it. I decided I would use an absolutely much of that as I possibly could. So you can see yes. the spaghetti wiring nightmare. I actually put a put a piece of metal on the floor here just to actually uh, look like you had a floor in it. Although mm -hmm. the one on the other side pretty obviously <laughs> doesn't. So um, yeah, that's where we're at. Um, front end's getting better. My daughter said, yeah, that's pretty good. I actually made up the bracket here to bolt the uh, motorbike yeah. and lights on the end of it. I still mm -hmm. haven't, not sure about clearances, but everything else looks all right. Same thing, uh, the bracket underneath the um, thing there. Most of the other Sonics on this planet, uh, in fact, uh, all bar one I've seen in New Zealand, actually do not do this. They don't open up this way. In fact, I'm just going to click my click inside, I think. Mm -hmm. Good on fiberglass. Let's get that up to there. So nearly all of them do not, just get that glare out of the way, um, do not open this way up here. And it's because of the silly wedging bit here. So most of them just push back about two or three centimetres. They have a yes. bar going across here and then they just pivot up on that bar and they just have at the end of this over here where I've got some engine, uh, some, um, uh, what do you call it? The hinges that I put into here. You know, there's mm -hmm. a whole thing. I put a whole metal plate in there. Most people do not do that. They just put a couple of um, press fit um, engine um, bonnet clips there and, mm -hmm. you know, they just lock them and so forth. But I decided to do things silly. What I'm trying to do at the moment, this is not in exactly the right spot. So anybody out there says it's not in the right spot, you're right, it's not. It's close, but I've just been mucking around with the radiator. A friend of mine mm -hmm. said, here's a radiator. He's got a two litre ZTEC that... Um, has been running on that radiator. He said it should be fine. Um, I've just been taking the old forward focus. Let me put them on the ground so it's a bit easier to see. Taking the good old uh, forward focus um, fit for fan, which I cut about double off because that used to only cover half the fan. Yeah. And my son also happened to leave out in the driveway a dishwasher, which I cut down and used the front panel of the dishwasher. <laughs> so uh, that's, that's actually... Um, where that's at, there's the radiator, basically. So um, I also, contrary to everybody else on the planet, um, this is the complete old set of um, brakes and everything else out of, clutch the whole mechanism. I made up a complete set of brackets. I've tuned them down and been welded them. So I'm using the original Ford Focus pedal set. Um, yep. Why? Because I can. I haven't even, yep. I put in place a power brake booster there. I'm not even sure that I'm going to use that at the moment. It's just yeah, yeah. there, um, just putting in place. So the good news is it's, you know, it's getting close. Um, I vowed, uh, like all good things, i a bit of a list man occasionally. So I listed here, you see in the back of my book, it runs for a couple of pages. Uh -huh. I first did this, there was 155 jobs in here. I did it about two months ago. Oh my God. Um, the, the good news is I've cut that down now to um, about 140 odd. But some of those are just buy something or get something or do something. I know. You know, one of those is also completely strip the body and paint it and um, completely strip the frame and paint that. So two of those jobs probably are more than just a two-hour job. But the reality is um, I've listed all those jobs because they're really, really important. Okay. Yeah. So there's a the shed. Um, my first bike up the back there. Um, it, as I said, this was my father-in-law's shed. He used to be in the market gardening. He used to import fruit grading equipment from Holland. Uh, mm -hmm. There's the nose cone. I've got him pretty good with the fuel tank in the Sonic, um, which is basically there standing on its side. So that's yeah, it's the fuel same tank. Yeah, so I've got. To, uh, then I've got to put that because that's in my cabin. The rules say mm -hmm. here you have to have it completely insulated from the rest of the cabin. So I've now basically built another fuel tank around it, although that's only made out of well, some of it's one mil, uh, 1.6 and some of it's three mil. So that's going in the cabin. That then goes inside of that and away we go. Mm -hmm. And yeah. there's bits and bobs that I'm actually getting better and I've started to label all the crates and things lying around. Mm -hmm. Plus everything else that my father-in-law's ever had in his shed, which I've tried to compact back into a bit less space. Okay. All right. Well, well done. I'm, I'm, you've taken me, I don't know if it's good or bad, but you've taken me back about 15 years <laughs> to my own build. <laughs> and right. I, it took me back to, uh, to a time 
where uh, and we were talking about this just before we went uh, live. It's it's you're going through your list, and I went through the same list, and and it's like you run in you 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 come face to face with a mountain, <laughs> and you reach yeah. that point where you just like give God give me some energy so I can take another step forward, <laughs> and. I'm so I'm really glad that um, you responded to the uh, to the email I sent you because <laughs> I, I yeah. think I may have actually helped you move along. Yeah, no, it's good. And as I said to you uh, just before you went on air, that the good news is that, uh, and that's what I'll get, then get on to the builders pub. Just trying to find a spot where there's um, put it over here, probably the best way, where I have less um, background lighting issues. Yeah, that's um, good there. Yeah. The, the, I mean, this whole thing, why would, why, why would I bother? It, it's an accountability to myself. It's accountability to, um, you know, getting what I've said to that I want to do. Because like all intentions that humans have, the minute we make a, um, what is it, some sort of a deal with ourselves, like a New Year's resolution, we actually get a warm fuzzy out of that New, New Year's resolution. You don't actually solve the problem that you're trying to solve. You just get a warm fuzzy out of it. Yeah. So um, the accountability, if you are going to tell people what your aspirations are, the accountability has to be really out there full time in, in your face because otherwise it's very easy just to get a warm fuzzy and say, oh, yeah, I'm building a kit car. Well, yeah. <laughs> there's a guy in the club that's been building a kit car for, I think, 24 years. Um, <laughs> <laughs> eventually, the warm fuzzies, <laughs> well, maybe they don't ever warm, uh, they don't ever wear out, I don't know. Um, but the reality is... It, the, you know, you've got to be in this, driving this um, to get, and then you can always pull something off and fix something up again. But if, if I'm not in this, driving this soon, the motivation to continue in this very lonely activity of car building yeah. um, is, is likely to get in the way. So um, it's sort of, you know, it's a bit of a, you are. It's almost, it's, I would liken it to, um, it's almost like you feel like you've let yourself down. And yep. if, if you come to that point and if you don't make those lists and if you don't even tick off that next one on the box and go to the, you know, go out to uh, pick up a, a wrecked part that you're looking for, then it's easy to, to slip backwards. Yep. Yeah. All right. So let's um, do a bit more on Sports Car Builders Club. So the good news is it's we've got 60 odd members in Western Australia, which is pretty good because that means there's 60 good cars out there or in projects being built. Yep. Yeah. Um, we do on the simplest form. Um, we meet once a meet uh, once a month um, in a uh, club room, which is based by another sports car. Uh, no, actually, yeah, so light car club um, meeting room. Um, we just meet over there, sit around, um, look at the cars out in the car park for half an hour, have a meeting mm -hmm. for half an hour, and yeah. then spend another hour talking about what we're doing and those sort of things to each other, just as a social. So it's really just a really informal social gathering. In fact. Um, being the secretary now, I just plow through the uh, agenda really quickly and 30 yeah. minutes is a good meeting. Any more than that is, um, is too long. They're not interested in that. So yeah. the president and the secretary and a few other people tend to do all the main nitty gritty type stuff and everybody else just turns up and has a good time. Mm -hmm. um, and we've had 30% turnout, 35% turnout. So, you know, getting 20 odd members to turn up to a meeting is pretty darn good. Um, okay, so that's the um, easiest bit once a month. The next bit is um, whenever there's a fine day, that we can go out today because it's a bit um, thing, but normally this time here I'd be heading over to a friend's place ready to get into his club at the moment and go for a drive somewhere and we go and have coffee, what we call coffee and lies. Uh, we go out and drive, you know, 5Ks, 10Ks, 30Ks, 40Ks, depending on where people are going. Mm -hmm. um, meet at a coffee shop, have um, have a little bit of uh, morning tea, a cup of coffee, and then come back home again and, you know, sit around and do nothing for the rest of the day. No, get into the shed and do what they've got to do. Um, yeah. The So that's the next bit. We've got members who we've also just organised in another month's time. We're taking out where our spouses are welcome. We, you know, try and get once or twice a year, um, 20 or 30 of us together with our partners to try and, you know, make this um, group a little bit more social, a little bit wider spread rather than just the boys having a coffee every second Sunday. Yeah. Um, and so we've got one of those coming up. We also have a Christmas function where we meet at the ex-president's place because it's 50 miles from my place or it's about 42 miles of my place. But it's mm -hmm. out in a bit of a um, rural area. So 
Um, there's three or four people who've got clubbies they take down there, and anybody who's new can just get in that club and go for a drive around the street. So it's you know good enough you can go for a bit of a fang without um, going too far over the speed limit without chance of getting booked. So you can have a bit of fun down at Barry's place, which is a good thing we do once a year. Mm-hmm. Um, and then just have a lunch and uh, sit around and chat, and then we come home from that. And the uh, last bit we're trying to do, we have done a few. Um, we organise some sort of speed event, so we organise uh, hill climb is one we've been done a couple of times. There's a couple of local towns that are quite happy to have uh, clubs turn up to. We just went up mm-hmm. to York uh, a couple of weeks ago, and uh, basically just took 10, 12 cars up there, park them in the car park. People walk past all day, say, "What are you doing? How are you doing?" A nice looking car, and all those sort of um, good things as well. So. There's lots of really uh, good ways. There's a couple more of those. So we probably do four of those events a year where we just go and log in somebody's car park. Um, you know, it could be that they've got a fair on. One of those is a school that's running a fair and they've just said, oh, we can get more people here if we have something good to look at. So they bring some nice cars in. from. The, so they ask a few car clubs to turn up with their members. Stick up your flyer. And if you're going to attract some new, in, new members, then that's a good thing. Um, and generally do those sort of publicity things. So that's what we do. Can um, I ask you something? Can I yep. ask you a quick question about um, yep. about the club? As I understand it from the Zoom meeting that you, I attended, um, it's more than just the social part and the, uh, I guess, the building part. But yep. you do take, um, you're part of the, you've assisted the government in in helping builders uh, get their cars registered. Could you just comment on that for a moment? Yep. The Department of Transport here, originally you could take two clubbies down on two consecutive days and one would pass and one would fail and the next day they both pass and the next day they both fail, depending on who was on duty, what their interpretation of the rules were, whether they liked the colour of it and all those sort of things. So we decided years ago, or the club decided years ago, that we, they would actually form with a brief of getting all of that sorted out. They worked with the Department of Transport to come up with a good set of guidelines and rules and uh, working out um, some negotiation about um, if one car follow exactly the same rules. So if you build a low cost exactly to the book, then and somebody else had had their car passed, then technically if all your welds were compliant and you had an engineer sign off on those, then you could get through on that same compliance. And that's been a really big step here because it means it's better for them because they don't have to go through and do all the testing for every single car. Mm-hmm. But yeah, so to work with the Department of Transport to come up with a consistent set of rules, we've actually got a booklet we produce for ourselves, which we make available to our members that you can... Um, go through and have a look and start ticking off things to make sure that you are compliant. So it's it's been a really good thing trying to negotiate. We've actually had some of the DOT, um, not the engineers from them so much, but the other people who are in the workshop down there doing the compliance, testing that actually, you know, take part in the club and uh, we quite frequently get in touch with them just to see where where we're at and where they're at to make sure that those rules and those um, you know, because we want safe cars, but we don't want to have safe cars that have to go through absolute hurdles to try and prove to somebody else that they are safe cars because nobody would drive a car that's not safe. You'd be stupid to do that. So, um, yeah, so working with the Department of Transport was a really important part. And as I said, yeah. we've uh, hopefully kept that going. And that was a really good part for the reason why the um, club did form. And um, the information that I'm trying now is to get all the wisdom that, that, our, in, that, that our good uh, car builders are doing and actually make that available to a whole lot of other people. So once again, like interviews like this and also with um, our other members who have been around for years to try and make sure that we all know um, what we're trying to do is good. Well, that's just awesome. Bruce, We've it just sounds like we just started, but really we're almost at the half an hour. And I know you said you like yep. to keep them short and sweet. So I'm going to bring myself back into the picture. Yep. And uh, oh, here we go. There's me and there's you, but I wanted to say thank you on behalf of Seven Spot because, uh, you know, <laughs> this is bad. Ciao for now, and we will see you at Seven Spot. Cheers.